Hey folks, welcome to the uh, Relevance Fallacies Lecture. And um, we've already encountered the term fallacy before uh, in chapters 3 and chapter 4. In chapter 3, we talked about um, deductive fallacies, which are fallacies of form. And just real quick, back up on the definition of a fallacy. It's a mistake in reasoning, an error in the logic of the argument. Another way to say it is it's a bad argument, or it doesn't even reach the level of being an argument. Um, now, the deductive fallacies we studied, like I said, are more about form. It's about, we know that a good deductive argument is valid and sound. The valid part refers to the form. And when a deductive argument fails to uh, adhere to or to reach up to the um, validity, the form of, of being valid, then we call it invalid. And there are particular forms that takes, in, uh, like affirming the consequent and denying the antecedent, um, that we studied in chapter 3. Now that's just an aside and just kind of to um, help you understand the rest of the fallacies we're going to be studying now. In chapter 4 on inductive reasoning, we briefly covered a couple inductive fallacies that had to do with sample arguments. So remember a sample argument is when you take a good representative sample of a population and then you draw some conclusion about that population, just like we did with the barrel of apples example. But in that chapter, we saw that you can, uh, quote unquote, fail to take enough apples out of the barrel. Uh, and these are called bias samples. And um, we even have a name for it when people give their own story only as the only justification uh, to believing in what they're saying or uh, in, in some sort of claim or proposition. And we call that anecdotal evidence. Uh, so that's a fallacy as well. Now we will encounter anecdotal evidence again, because uh, as you can see from the name of chapter seven, it's inductive fallacy. So my point in kind of this preamble is that the uh, first fallacies we discussed were about form. We're now moving on to more specifically focusing on fallacies of content. And the reason why there's two full chapters devoted to that in the text is because fallacies of content are much more common. So that's what fallacies are. Now, chapter six deals with relevance fallacies. And what that means is it means the, the topic of relevance. So it's saying these are fallacies of relevance. In other words, they're actually irrelevant. Um, they, they happen when the premise is irrelevant to the conclusion. So we class them as relevance fallacies, but they are, they happen when the premise is not relevant to the conclusion. Uh, the next chapter, like I said, inductive fallacies will basically be cases in which the premise may be relevant to the conclusion, it may connect somehow, but it's not enough. And that's really what anecdotal evidence is. When somebody says they saw God in the woods or something, it's not that their experience wasn't related to God. It was relevant in the sense that they believed it was connected, but it just wasn't enough evidence to support the claim that God exists from only their experience. So anyways, inductive fallacies will still have some relevance, there just won't be enough um, or good enough evidence. But that's chapter seven. For now, in chapter six, we're just gonna look at fallacies that, um, in which the premise is not relevant to the conclusion. So just a brief list of what we're gonna look at. Um, and let me mention now that there, this is not an exhaustive list. You can look online on YouTube videos and you'll see that there are many different types of fallacies out there. This is going to include, this is going to be on almost every list because I try to choose the most important popular fallacies um, based on my own scholarship and experience. Uh, but the point is, is that there will be some fallacies out there that are not on the list. And the point of this list isn't to be exhaustive. The point of this list is to give us frameworks to help us recognize bad reasoning. And also, there are some times where a person makes a poor argument doesn't have enough evidence or doesn't, the claim isn't relevant. And it doesn't even necessarily fit a category of fallacy. It's just bad reasoning. So I kind of reserve that last uh, fallacy there for that case, we call it irrelevant conclusion, when uh, the speaker just derails the conversation to a different topic and moves away from the point of the argument, um, sometimes called missing the point. Uh, I, I would just consider that irrelevant conclusion. Um, so you can't always name every fallacy. Nevertheless, humans reason in similar ways, so there are certain fallacy types that crop up. And the two perhaps most common that I see are at the top of the list there, and that's the ad hominem and the straw man. 
So just so you have a nice clear definition, um, a fallacy is a mistaken reasoning in which the premise is not relevant to or inadequate to support the conclusion. And I just kind of explained that difference between relevance and, and ina inadequacy. Now, another important part, thing to remember about this section is that just because there's a fallacy in a source, that doesn't discredit the whole source. So for instance, sometimes authors might intersperse, they'll mix in fallacies with the rest of their writing. Um, sometimes they might do it on purpose, knowingly being funny. Other times they may legitimately have failed to see something in their reasoning, but my point is, just because they made one mistake in their reasoning process of an entire passage, that doesn't take away from everything else they're saying in the passage. So if you're reading a passage and you see someone say, describe a theory, and you know it's a mistake, you know that it doesn't represent the theory accurately, that would, as we'll see, that would be a straw man, a misinterpretation. But that doesn't mean you don't listen to the rest of what they say in the passage. You just say, okay, on this point they made a mistake, I'm going to move on to the next one. Um, because otherwise we're being biased ourselves, right? Otherwise we are um, letting our own, uh, you know, going back to cognitive biases, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, we're letting our own biases kick in if we don't give the author a fair shake, a fair shot, um, just because they committed a, a fallacy here or there. Now on the other hand, if you've read through most of a passage and it's just littered, you know, with mistakes and reasoning and poor um, inferences from bad evidence and so forth, then yeah, there's a certain point at which you are justified in, um, in kind of saying, all right, I'm not going to take anything seriously about this reading anymore. And by the way, I'm saying writing, but this could apply to a YouTube video or to a, um, a lecture and, and so forth. Now, uh, let me distinguish briefly cognitive biases from fallacy. A, a fallacy is a little more complex usually because um, a fallacy masquerades as a full-blown argument, so a person creating a fallacy might actually write out a full position, and the whole position is just a mistake. There's an error in the logical process there. Whereas a bias is more instantaneous, um, and as you can tell from the name, it, it's unconscious. It, it, it just sort of happens. We don't realize that we are kind of failing to look at the evidence on the opposite side with as much, um, or sorry, we're, we're, we don't realize that we're failing to look at the evidence on our side with as much detail and scrutiny as we are with the evidence on the other side. Right? We, it's, it's unconscious in, in the case of the confirmation bias. Um, and so a, a bias is a more immediate error in your brain, just going back to evolution, but um, a fallacy you may have a full-blown cognitive process of slow thinking might actually be an operation, but you may have just missed uh, some process of the reasoning. So anyways, that's that difference. Now this last point I want to emphasize, because this will come up again and again on the classwork and homework. Uh, one of the ways we can, because the whole point of this class is so that you can be a better reasoner. That's, you're supposed to be a better, better critical thinker after the class. So one of the ways I can test for that is to see if you have the ability to see the difference between bad reasoning and good reasoning. And I'm pointing now to that last bullet point on the slide, which said fallacies can be turned into arguments by changing the premise or conclusion. Uh, and so I'll show you and give you some examples of doing that as to how we can turn a failed argument into a good argument by creating premises. And this will have the effect of helping you understand, oh yeah, yeah, that's what makes a good argument, that's what makes a bad argument. And really, that's all I want you to get out of this class. What's a good argument, what's a bad argument? Um, and so anyways, we'll be doing that in the exercises. So what I'm going to do now is briefly go over each fallacy and maybe just give an example or two. Uh, and then I'm going to do a couple examples where um, I give you a passage and have you choose which one the fallacy is, which will help you get ready for the assessment and the um, homework and so forth. And, uh, and we'll just go from there. Okay, so the first fallacy is the ad hominem. And this is one of the most, um, uh, most common fallacies. And you think it's strange because the ad hominem, by the way, literally means at the man. It's a Latin phrase. And we tend to say it today as at the person. And what that means is that it's, it, you're, you're, it's a fallacy because you're attempting to create an argument. But instead of, create a legitimate, instead of creating a legitimate premise to support your conclusion, 
you instead include a premise that attacks the person you're talking to. Uh, now, in some cases, this can be as childish as it sounds, right? It can be, you're an idiot. I mean, it can be like two five-year-olds fighting over a toy. And sometimes, as we all know, adults can be just like children. Um, but in other cases, it's more subtle. In other cases, it's like, well, this guy can't, um, uh, this guy can't be the one to help me here. I mean, look at him. He, he can't tell me what to do with my life in terms of losing weight. I mean, he's not super skinny himself. That's a much more subtle ad hominem where instead of listening to the advice of someone, whether or not they can follow that advice themselves, um, instead of taking that advice on its own grounds, we look to the person who said it and we start kind of thinking about their characteristics. So as you can see in this PowerPoint slide, with the ad hominem fallacy, there's sort of a shift from Jose, what is Jose is saying, which could, we could evaluate independently, to Jose himself. And it, the claims would be just as independent from Jose as his car would or anything else he owns. Now granted, a car is related to the person who buys it, and the claims are related to the person who says it, uh, it, who says them. And so what we have to be careful about here is that, what we have to say here then is that um, the ad hominem is only a fallacy when we completely dismiss somebody's argument over their personal characteristics. We're, we're justified in being skeptical, totally justified in being skeptical. If, say, somebody is giving me advice and they're, let's say, let's say they're severely overweight and they're giving me advice on how to lose weight myself, um, I could maybe be skeptical and say, well, this guy can't follow, but, but to reject what he's saying outright, that would be the ad hominem. Um, because again, even if he can't follow his own advice, he may have read stuff that I haven't read. He may have more knowledge. He may have a friend who's a doctor, who's a nutritionist, who knows more than I know, um, even if he can't follow the advice himself. I can be skeptical while still listening. Right? So it's important to understand that subtle difference in the ad hominem. We can be skeptical of a person based on their characteristics. Another example would be if somebody was gonna get up and give a lecture on, let's say, global warming, and they had no um, academic degree right, in that subject. So if somebody got up to speak and they didn't have that education, I might be skeptical at first and say, well, can this guy really know without the proper background? Um, but I would still listen and give him a chance and maybe I would find out that this person has actually done their own study to the extent that they worked with people at, um, who, who actually did study in higher education on the topic. Right? Who knows what is gonna be revealed about this person's argument. I can still be skeptical while listening. So that's not the ad hominem, to be skeptical. It's only the ad hominem when you completely reject an argument based on the circumstances. Now, there are also variations on the ad hominem, and I, you'll, you'll notice in the reader that I include some variations, but um, I'm not gonna go over all of them in the lecture, but I'll go over this one real quick, because I think we've all had this experience um, so one, um, or at least we've seen, we were aware of this experience. So this one's called poisoning the well. Right? Sometimes people will um, poison your ideas in advance, so to speak, before you even have a chance to say them. You know, it's like if you're about to get up on stage and speak, and the speaker before you says, oh, this guy has a father who was a Nazi. Okay, go ahead and speak, right? Or, or something, whether it's true or not. Um, if you poison the well in advance of somebody talking, then everyone else listening already has that negative impression of that person um, without really giving them a chance to speak their mind first, right? So their own personal characteristics are pre-poisoning their, their discussion. Uh, and then another one that is sometimes given its own separate category, um, I'm gonna include it in the same uh, sort of family as the ad hominem, it's called the genetic. And it's when instead of dismissing an idea because of the specific person, you dismiss an idea because it's related to a specific group. Uh, the obvious example here being the way that sometimes when the Democrats in the U.S. Senate create a bill, the Republicans won't even look at it because it was written by Democrats, right? Regardless of the merits that might be in the bill, and vice versa. Right? And there's times where the Democrats won't look at something the Republicans have written merely because they wrote it. So these are all in that same family of dismissing something because of the creator, because of the um, characteristics of the thing that created it, whether that's a person um, or a group or organization. Um, and it could actually also be a time period. You could dismiss something because it was came from a certain time 
but as we all know, truth is independent of time. So just because it came, it doesn't mean it's not true, just because it came from a time from the past. Okay, so the straw man, um, the straw man is, gets its name, as you can see in that uh, picture there, from a metaphor. And the idea is that if you quote unquote beat up a straw man, it's not really a great thing, is it? Nobody would congratulate you. In fact, they probably think there's something wrong with you if you pushed a straw man to the ground. Not only that, but it's much easier to push a straw man to the ground and feel superior than it is to push a real man to the ground. Um, so the idea is metaphorically, it's much easier to put a fake, uh, not truly representative version of a person's argument down than it is to fully understand and characterize a person's argument before responding to it. Uh, so, you know, we often see stereotypes that make this, uh, stereotypes about groups of people, you know, like, um, that liberals are all communists or something, right? There's a bit of a straw man there. Uh, and by the way, as we'll see, there's multiple fallacies in that claim. That claims can have multiple fallacies, and we'll talk about that later. But certainly that would be a straw man, right? And sometimes you hear that, uh, from the Democratic side that conservatives and Republicans are just people who want to go to war and they don't care if our children die and you know you see all these terrible smearings of groups on the other side and uh, it often is based on a real misunderstanding of the core principles of that um, belief system. Uh, we see this with religion, we see, we see this from religious people to atheists and from atheists to religious folks Right? Sometimes atheists are depicted as immoral, for example, even though there's no evidence of that. Um, uh, sometimes religious folks are all depicted as irrational, even though that's an oversimplification um, of, of their belief system for, mo for most people. Uh, so a straw man happens when we, it's just, to just put it simply, it's a misinterpretation of what someone's saying. That's it. It's when, if you've ever been misinterpreted, you may have found yourself saying something like this. No, 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 wait a minute. No, 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 that's not what I said. That's not what I said. This is what I said. Uh, it's very easy for others to misunderstand us and for us to misunderstand others. And part, part of that is because it's just human communication is difficult. Um, but that's what happens with a straw man. One uh, thing that's come up recently that I find interesting, uh, some thinkers in the last five or ten years, and I'm not sure who this traces back to, but they've come up with the idea of what they call the steel man the steel man. And you don't have to know this for the assessment, I'm just adding this to help you understand straw man. A steel man happens when we create the best interpretation of a person's argument so that there's no danger of us misunderstanding them. Right, so next time you're in a discussion, maybe make some effort, if you actually aren't sure what someone's coming from, maybe make some effort to say, wait, wait, no, seriously, is this, is this what you mean? Is this what you're saying? So you're saying blah, 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 you know, not in a rhetorical way where you go, oh, you're saying, and then you say something stupid. But, I mean, you actually try to figure out and construct from steel rather than straw the person's position. Um, and that means that you're not in danger of using a fallacy of the straw man. So, let's say somebody said, you want to keep defense spending at current levels? What, you don't think we should be able to defend ourselves from a place called Iceland? From a place like Iceland? You want to keep defense spending at current levels? You don't want to increase them? What, you don't think we should be able to defend ourselves from a place like Iceland? So this can be seen as a straw man here because um, the person who wants to keep defense spending at current levels isn't saying they don't want it to be able to defend themselves from a country like Iceland, right? That's an over-interpretation, over-exaggeration of what the person is saying. Um, the speaker is using the straw man as a way to make that person's argument look ridiculous just because they want to keep uh, defense spending at the current level, but it's not really what the person is saying. So that's the straw man can often be used strategically, and people who are really good at using logic to their advantage, in other words, they're good at logic, they're not good critical thinkers. They're good at the logical process of putting arguments together, and they serve it for their own confirmation bias, right? Um, they'll use the straw man against you. Right? They'll misinterpret your claims on purpose to make you look bad, and then kind of ask you questions about them, even though you already don't believe it. So one last thing I'll say about the straw man 
is uh, it's hard at first sometimes to understand what the fallacy is saying. And I would, if you're still struggling with that, I would say, think of something that you're really good at doing. Like what's something that you really excel at? What's something that you really do well? Now imagine someone comes in and totally misinterprets it. Right? So, um, you know, let's say you're like a snowboarder and you have all these like really detailed um, rules and different techniques and even um, almost superstitions around how you uh, use a snowboard and how you and, and you and you're really experienced. And some idiot just jumps in and says, "Oh yeah, it's really easy to snowboard. You just jump on the board and you go down the hill." Right, and you're like, whoa, 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 it's way more complicated. Like there's subtle, you know, differences to the turns and to the wind and, um, and it depends on how steep the slope is, right? You have all these details about how, how it, what it takes to snowboard. And some idiot just comes in and says, it's that simple. You just get on a board and roll down the hill, right? And glide down the hill. So you have to think of something you know well and then imagine some idiot making fun of it and not understanding it, right? That would be a straw man because a straw man happens when there's a misinterpretation. And it's easier for you to see a misinterpretation of something if you already know that thing very well. So that's just some advice for getting your hands around that fallacy. Okay, so um, I'm gonna go through one more and then I'm gonna do an example um, and ask you to uh, figure out which of the last three fallacies we've covered fits. But the next one we're gonna do is uh, the false dilemma. So the false dilemma is also very common um, it happens when uh, we oversimplify things and uh, we oversimplify them in a specific way. We say that, um, look, either this or that, right? Th this is the either or fallacy. Either you do this or that, and then it's usually suggested that one of the options is ridiculous. So the idea is, come on, either we do this or we do that, but we're not gonna do that. So we might as well do the first one. We might as well do the first one. So the person presenting the false dilemma wants you to do one option, and they present the other option as it's really terrible, so they want you to reject that other one, and they paint it terribly on purpose so that you'll choose the first one. Now you can probably see already that this fallacy can somewhat work together with a straw man. And like I said, sometimes fallacies can work together. There can be multiple fallacies in one passage, not always. But there are times when people will present a false choice, but also a misinterpretation of one of those choices. The false dilemma isn't always that way, though. Sometimes it's just presenting a, a false option. Sometimes it's, there isn't that sort of taunting to choose one over the other necessarily. It's just kind of like one of the options is ridiculous. Uh, so the whole point is that the reason it's a fallacy is that there are obviously, in many cases, more than two options. Right? Um, most of the time, there's some sort of middle ground. Uh, you know, for instance, a common false dilemma is, look, either you believe in God, or you believe in science. And um, we've seen in our world today that there are many, many people who have no problem believing in the truths of science and also having faith in God. Um, so it clearly doesn't have to be one or the other in that case. Um, and yet, sometimes it's presented that way. So that's the false dilemma. Um, now, there are a couple of variations on this. Uh, and one is the perfectionist. So the perfectionist fallacy happens when it's the same idea, either this or that. But it basically, the, the option in this case is, look, either it's perfect or forget it we're not gonna do it at all. Either it's perfect or forget it, all right? So, and I hope you can see um, that just because something's not perfect doesn't mean it's not worth doing it. Uh, you know, firemen and the fire departments are not gonna stop every single fire. They're not perfect. Does that mean it's not worth having a fire department? Of course not, because even if we stop a lot of fires, that's still worth it, even if there are some that slide through the cracks. So not everything needs to be perfect to be good. That's why this is a fallacy. Sometimes people assume that either it's absolutely perfect and there's nothing wrong with it or it's not worth it whatsoever. So that's the perfectionist. So let me just put a couple examples up here on the screen and then I'm gonna um, give you the answers just to make sure we're kind of on the um, right track here. Okay, so first, 
we have giving aid to Russia means that we care more about Russia than our own people. So we shouldn't give aid to Russia. Giving aid to Russia means we care more about Russia than our own people, so we shouldn't give aid to Russia. Now you're trying to figure out which of the previous fallacies I just presented would fit these categories. So that's the first one. The second one is, you play the lottery, so why should I listen to you when you tell me to stop gambling? Second one, you play the lottery, why should I listen to you when you tell me to stop gambling? Next one, no proposal will fix everything. I am against the health plan. No proposal will fix everything. I am against the health plan. Finally, Jen said she wants either grapes or cherries. The store doesn't have grapes, so we'll have to get cherries. Jen said she wants either grapes or cherries. The store doesn't have grapes, so we'll have to get cherries. Okay, now I recommend um, pausing the video here and thinking about those for a minute and thinking about what category fits um, what example of fallacy. Okay, so I'm going to start with the first one. Uh, giving aid to Russia means that we care more about Russia than our own people, so we shouldn't ga give any aid to Russia. Um, now, I know some of you may have seen a false dilemma here, and I think there's a partial implied false dilemma because there's a suggestion either you give aid to Russia or you care more about your own people. However, to me, that's not the main essence of the passage. The main essence of the passage is them saying, giving aid to Russia means, right? They, they use the word means, implies that, uh, right? Suggests that. They're, they're saying, this is what it means to do this. And then, after the word means, they completely misinterpret what it means to give aid to another country, right? Giving aid to another country doesn't mean that you care more about that country. It means that you want to help them and you care about human suffering in the world. Um, Right, so in other words, it misinterprets what it means to want to give aid to another country. This is why I call it a straw man. Uh, and it concludes very clearly, so we shouldn't give any aid to Russia, right? And the only reasoning given is a misinterpretation of what that means. So again, I see a partial false dilemma, but the best answer, in my opinion here, and I think it's backed up by that word means, the best answer is the straw man, the straw man. Um, now, let me point out that in some of the examples, I choose examples that are a little more ambiguous to give you help, um, you know, give you harder examples to make you better at recognizing fallacies. But on the assessments, the examples won't be ambiguous. They'll be, they'll be very direct and fit each category clearly. So I give you difficult examples to, for practice, but on the assessment, they're more clear. So that's a straw man. The next one, you play the lottery. Why should I listen to you when you tell me to stop gambling? This is a perfect ad hominem, um, right? Just because of the person's characteristics, having playing the lottery, that other person is deciding, well, I'm not, you tell me to stop gambling, I'm not listening to your argument just because you play the lottery. Right? They don't ever consider that maybe even if that person plays the lottery, that their gambling habit might be a problem as well. Uh, so instead of dealing with the logic of, whether it's good or bad to play the lottery, they focus on the personal characteristics of the person they were speaking to regarding gambling. So once again, that's an ad hominem uh, uh, fallacy. No proposal, the next one is, no proposal will fix everything, I'm against the health plan. This is a perfectionist false dilemma fallacy. Uh, you again have that idea that something has to be perfect, right? They say, no proposal will fix everything, so we shouldn't do it. It ain't gonna be perfect, so I'm not gonna do it. Instead of pointing out the ways that somebody could easily counter-argue and say, well, yeah, it's not gonna fix everything, but it's gonna fix this, this, and this, and this, and this, and that's worth it. Just because it doesn't fix everything, that's not an argument as to why it's not worth doing it. So that would be a perfectionist fallacy. Now, the next one's tricky, and I haven't told you that this yet, but that's okay, because this is the instructional video. Sometimes there will be examples that don't have a fallacy. Right? So that will actually be an option on some of the assessment questions. It'll say no fallacy. And this is because the whole point of the class is for you to be able to tell the difference between good and bad reasoning, as I said before. So you should be able to recognize a, fa a passage where there isn't an error in reasoning and it's just a normal argument. And that's exactly what's happening in this last argument about Jen. Jen said she wants either grapes or cherries. The store doesn't have grapes, so I'll have to get cherries. So this is a perfectly reasonable argument, and it seems like a false dilemma because it says either or. But notice it's not an illegitimate dilemma. 
there can be a real dilemma. Right? If, if Jen tells me, hey, look, I want only these two things, that isn't about like, um, either we're going to fight, you know, either with the terrorists or not. That's about these are the things she wants. She has stipulated, I want these two things. And then in the argument, the speaker says, they didn't have this, so I'll get that. Right? Um, so this is a legitimate argument with a legitimate dilemma. To be a false dilemma, it has to fit the form of really over-exaggerating one of the options. In this case, it doesn't do that. Um, it doesn't, it's, it suggests one or the other in a logical way, not in a way that is built on faulty reasoning. So this would not include a fallacy. This would not include a fallacy. Okay, so let's move on to the last couple fallacies and we'll do a few more examples. So the next one very commonly comes up with arguments for and against God uh, and it's called the misplaced burden of proof. And before I get there, let me um, back up and let me say what a legitimate, what, what we tend to mean by the burden of proof. In law, even, in, in like in a court of law, this applies, but even in just everyday conversations, sometimes this expression will come up. The burden of proof is on the person making the claim. Burden means weight, right? So the weight of the, tr of, of the proof, like if somebody says that something is the case, if you come out making an argument, it's on you to show why, right? Even on a very basic level, like if you're a kid playing out on the street and you tell all your friends, hey, the ice cream man is coming, right? Like the burden is on you to tell them why and where. You have to say, I heard him over there when I was walking home and he's coming on this street next. Like, and then your friends will listen and you'll see if you're, if you're telling the truth. But the burden is on you. You would the kid who who saw the ice cream truck would never come back and say, "Guys, I saw the ice cream man." And then someone asked him, "Oh, how do you know?" He would never say, "Well, can you tell me that I didn't see it?" Right? That doesn't make any sense. And yet, that's exactly what the misplaced burden of proof does. It misplaces that burden. The burden is supposed to be on the person who said it to begin with. If you say God exists, if you say there's a leprechaun in the forest, as in the example on the PowerPoint. If you say there's an ice cream truck, right? If you say you saw a UFO, the burden is on you, my friends, to prove it, right? It, you don't get to shift it cleverly to the other side. You know, you don't get, well, can you prove I didn't see the UFO? Can you prove God doesn't exist? Can you prove there isn't a leprechaun? All of those are a misuse of logic. And we actually sometimes call that an appeal to ignorance, which means that we jump from a point of not no knowledge, ignorance, to a point of knowledge. Because that's what you're saying when you're saying you can't prove it, right? There's no proof, nobody knows, therefore it's true, right? That doesn't follow. If you can't prove something, all that that's all that is. It's you don't know. You don't jump that to I do know from I don't know. And that's what happens when you use the misplaced burden of proof. By the way, it's equally fallacious to jump that you from that you don't know from the fact that um, uh, or sorry, that, that something doesn't exist from the fact that we don't know. You know, so you equally couldn't say, well, you can't prove God does exist, therefore he doesn't exist. That's also the appeal to ignorance and the, um, more broadly, the misplaced burden of proof. Okay, so the next one is called begging the question. And sometimes this fallacy is discussed or talked about as circular reasoning. And you can see in the diagram there, um, sort of, uh, that's why it's a problem. Circular reasoning works because circular reasoning works because it just keeps going. So in an argument, a failed argument that attempts to use the begging and the question fallacy that uses that fallacy, what's the argument is basically going to say is it's going to say the same thing twice. That's why we call it reasoning in a circle. It reasons from the conclusion back to the conclusion. So an argument, as you know by now, is a sophisticated machine that includes premises that support or prove a conclusion that go together, that are relevant to each other. But when you have circular reasoning where there's relevance, but there's actually nothing new offered, it's basically two, either two premises or two conclusions. And the way this is achieved is that there's very often very sophisticated wording used. Um, big words that sound fancy but really mean the same thing. And um, so, for instance, sometimes you hear people say, well, the law, sometimes you hear people say this, they'll say something like, you can't do that, it's the law, 
right? Don't do that. It's the law. And kind of what they're saying there, if we were to extend out their thinking process, there would probably be a begging the question fallacy at the base of it. So consider this example. Someone says, the law against stealing is just and right. After all, it's the law. So that argument doesn't actually say, that passage doesn't actually say why it's just and right. right? It, just, it just basically says, the law is just and right because it's just and right. It doesn't give any new information. It's After all, it's the law. Before marijuana was legalized in many of the states that it's been legalized in, you often heard that argument um, going back and forth. Right? You heard people who were against marijuana legalization saying that. and say, well, it's illegal. It's, it's against the law. And then you had people in favor of it saying, no, but why? It doesn't deserve to be illegal because it's not as harmful as other drugs right? and so forth. Again, I'm not saying who's right or wrong there. I'm just saying that was an argument that was had. And oftentimes, the people who were defending the prohibition of marijuana were actually using a begging the question fallacy because they're just pointing to the fact that it's illegal as a justification for why we should keep it illegal. So anyways, that's one sort of more recently relatable example of um, how the begging the question fallacy comes into play. So in order to, to make an argument about marijuana prohibition, you wouldn't just point to it being the law. You would say, this is why it causes these, you would cite studies and so forth, right? You would give a reason why it should be illegal. You wouldn't just say it's illegal because it's illegal already, right? So anyways, that's that. Okay, the appeal to emotion. So the appeal to emotion is very broad, as we all know. There's a lot of different emotions one can experience. Um, I do want to point out, kind of like I did with the ad hominem here, that this there's nothing wrong with emotion. This isn't some sort of this isn't telling you not to be emotional, and it's not sexist. Sometimes people might falsely see it that way. It's not saying that like you know like women are more likely to use a fallacy, they're more emotional. First of all, I don't even think it's true that women are more emotional, depending on how we define emotion. But the point is, is that there's nothing wrong with emotion. Um, it's just when we use emotion as the only source of our argument, that's a problem. Because whether you're a man or a woman, emotional is highly variable, right? Think about if you're yelling and screaming one night with your significant other, you're going to be very, very different in terms of the ability to create an argument and be rational than if you're at work and you're perfectly calm and just talking to a coworker. So um, you can't base an entire reasoning process on an emotion. Now, an emotion could be part of the beginning of a reasoning process. So for instance, I think back to um, you know, somebody like Malcolm X or somebody who was very angry about race relations and even went the route of violence in some cases. You might say um, they were very emotional, but they had more of a righteous anger right? because there was legitimate everyday racism that they were dealing with. Um, so in that case, there's anger, but they also had good reasons. They were fighting legitimate oppression. That's different than just you know, using nothing but emotion um, to support your claim. Let's take, let me just go down the list here and give you a couple examples of those listed. Uh, we heard this a lot when um, President Trump got elected. There's no way we can allow him to get elected. It makes me so mad that people voted for him. Uh, obviously sometimes there was reasoning given, like why do people vote for this guy for, because he has these characteristics, but sometimes it was just anger. Just like, how could people have voted for him? And in those cases, it would just be considered outrage, right? Sometimes people freak out, they get angry, they vent, and there's not really any logic involved in the whole process. It's just upset. Uh, I hear this one a lot. Pity. Please, Mr. Cuddy, I need an A on the final assessment. Otherwise, my parents will disown me and I won't get into my favorite school. Uh, so I'm sure some of you have done that. It's okay. Just try not to do it again in the future. We professors know it's a bad reasoning. We don't like to hear it. Um, and of course, the reason it's a problem is that your desire to get into a good school has nothing to do with your performance in the class. Your grade is, of course, determined by your performance in the class. Apple polishing is also common with professors. Um, Mr. Cuddy, you're such a great professor. Maybe you can reconsider my grade on the last paper. Same idea. How I feel about you and 
how much you uh, may or may not like me as a person isn't related to uh, your grade on the last paper. Okay. Now, I want to just give a couple examples here to make another, one more point. So, here's two examples, and I want you to briefly consider which fallacies, if any, fit the, the categories here uh, of the appeals to emotion. Which appeals to emotion um, would fit for these examples? First one, honey, you're so understanding. Will you do the dishes just this once? Honey, you're so understanding. Will you do the dish dishes just this once? That's the first one. Second one, I have extra money that I don't need. I think I'll give some away to charity. I have extra money that I don't need. I think I'll give some away to charity. Okay, so the first one. So again, pause it and think about those for a minute. And again, you're thinking, which appeals to emotion would those apply to? Uh, which are those examples of? So the first one is apple polishing. Honey, you are so understanding. We do the dishes just this once. Right? They talk of, the speaker talks about it to their spouse, presumably, um, bumps up their ego by saying, oh, you're an understanding person, and then asks them to do something for them, right? So the fact that they're understanding isn't related to them doing the dishes, right? A better reason would be, hey, I've done the dishes the last three times, it's your turn, right? But instead, they bump up the person's ego and try to get them to do it. So that one is apple polishing. Now the next one, I have extra money I don't need, I think I'll give some away to charity. That actually is not a fallacy. Um, and the reason for that is that they are not being driven by an emotion to do something that's out of proportion with the reason or the premise provided. So in other words, it's a legitimate reason um, to give some money to away to a charity if you have more than you need. Right? That's not an unreasonable response. It would be pity if the person said something like, you know, man, I, like if they were really poor and then they saw a homeless person on the street and they felt really sad and they therefore gave the money away based on the feeling of sadness in the moment, then that would be more of an, uh, they, they would have been driven by their own appeal to pity fallacy. Um, but in the case of this example, it's, it's a legitimate reason is provided. If you have extra money and you don't need it, to give some away to charity is not an irrelevant, irrational response um, justified by the fact that you have more money, right? extra money that you don't need. So this one, to be clear, is not a fallacy because there is still a legitimate connection between the premise and conclusion. So that's what you're looking for here when you're trying to identify fallacies. Is it still legitimate? Is it, can it still be considered an argument? Is there a legitimate reasoning provided? If not, it's a fallacy. If it is, it's not a fallacy. Okay, so like I said, the last one, the irrelevant conclusion um, is uh, basically for any other fallacies that don't fit the category. Now there is one type of fallacy that um, I think I mentioned in the reader that I'll mention here that does come up and the name comes up a lot, so I'll, I'll teach it to you guys. And it often fits in this category as an irrelevant conclusion as well. And it's called the red herring. So the red herring fallacy it basically gets its name, it's a metaphor. A red herring you probably know is a type of fish. Um, and it's a metaphor, and it actually goes back to early Britain when uh, they used to have hunting dogs. And the dogs would be out on a trail chasing a fox or something like that with a hunting party. And there were times when the dog, you know, the dog picks up the scent of the other animal and the dog is chasing it. And there are times when the other animal gets away, and the dog, but the dog still keeps trying to chase its scent. Chase its scent. So the hunters need to derail the dog's scent away from that, um, the prey. So what they do is they drag a real, an old red herring, a fish, across the trail in front of the dog, which is very pungent, smells a lot, obviously. And now the dog's scent is derailed to that direction so that he doesn't just keep needlessly chasing the animal that's gone. Um, now that's the metaphor for a red herring. What happened, so in the same way that you pull the dog's scent away from the trail, you're, when you use a red herring, you're pulling the point away from the argument, right? The argument has a certain point, and you bring up an irrelevant aspect of it. Uh, you know, sometimes you hear people correct for this in a conversation. You say, wait a minute, what, why are you talking about that now? I was talking about this, right? Like, wait, I thought we were talking about 
blah, 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 but you just change the subject right, to this other topic. What's, why are we talking about this now? I thought we were talking about that. Um, so that's a red herring. And so basically when the topic gets derailed unfairly, and again, we're also applying this to cases of bad reasoning that don't fit any other category. So let me give you one example of an irrelevant conclusion slash red herring here. Uh, the animal rights people shouldn't pick on rodeos. If they come out and see the clowns put smiles on these kids' faces, they change their minds. The animal rights people shouldn't pick on rodeos. If they come out and see the clowns put smiles on kids' faces, they change their minds. So in this case, the speaker, rather than addressing what are presumably animal rights abuses of the rodeos where animals are being mistreated, they divert the conversation to the fact that at the rodeos, kids laugh because there's clowns. So they, so instead of kind of addressing the real core of the issue, which is the animal rights violations, the speaker shifts the conversation, right? He uses the red herring, pulls the conversation away, just as we'd pull the hunting dog away to a different scent, pulls the conversation away to a different topic about the kids having, having fun at the rodeo, right? Kids could still have fun at the rodeo and there could still be animal rights abuses. So um, he pulls it away unfairly, uh, illegitimately, irrationally to a different topic. And so that's why we call it uh, an irrelevant conclusion. Okay, so I'm just gonna give two examples of turning a fallacy into an argument because I know that seems a little, that's a little weird, and I, and I do have some examples in the reader, but let me just kind of give some on the video here. So let's say I used, w w what I'll do here is I'm gonna present the fallacy, I'll explain the fallacy it is, and I'll put it up on the screen, and then I'll switch it up so that I've turned the fallacy into an argument, and I'll put that new argument up on the screen so you can see that whole process. Okay, so here's the fallacy. The agreement binds us, thus we should honor the agreement. The agreement binds us, thus we should honor the agreement. So I consider this to be the begging uh, the question fallacy. And the reason for that is that an agreement already by definition sort of binds you, right? That's what an agreement does. It binds people together by certain rules or whatever the um, stipulations were. And so honoring the agreement and the agreement binding us, it's close enough to where the speaker isn't really offering anything new here. So we consider this begging the question. It's reasoning in a circle, not enough new is being provided in the conclusion. Now, what if I wanted to turn that into an argument? Well, one of the things that you can do is what I, what I like to do to do this is I write out some premises, like the premise conclusion format we've done, you know, like one, two, and three, and then I write the conclusion of the fallacy that was given, just the conclusion, and I forget about the premise for now. So in this case, it says, we should honor the agreement. So now I'm gonna write out some reasons, and my conclusion's gonna be, we should honor the agreement. And now I have to think to myself, and this is the creative part, what possible reasons would it take to make a good argument as to why one should honor an agreement. What reasons would legitimately provide evidence as to why we should honor this agreement? Obviously, it doesn't, it's not good evidence to say what the first speaker said and say the agreement binds us because that's more or less what it means to honor an agreement, that it binds us. So what I come up with is I said, first, we are friends and we respect each other. That's one good reason to honor the agreement. And second, we both signed the agreement. That's another good reason to honor the agreement. Right? So now I've gone beyond it being an agreement to we've both codified the agreement with a signature. That's something different. And I've also added that we're friends and respect each other, even more reason to honor an agreement that we both entered into willingly. So now new additional reasons have been provided as to why we should honor the agreement. So I've turned what was a fallacy into an argument by providing legitimate reasoning. So that's what I mean when I ask you to turn a fallacy into an argument. Um, the next one, the mainstream media like the idea, but they are known for their liberal bias, so the idea will never work. The mainstream media like the idea, but they are known for their liberal bias, so the idea will never work. 
So this is a fallacy I would consider the genetic fallacy. Um, it seems to be rejecting the idea because of its connection to a liberal bias. Um, and uh, without giving any really arguments or evidence about the idea itself, right? It just says these people like it, it won't work because they're connected to it, and um, so it won't work. So there isn't really any, the, the content of the idea isn't provided. So if I were to turn that into an argument, I would just simply add a very basic premise. I'd say the idea is stupid and misguided, therefore it will never work. Now I'm referring to the content of the idea. And of course, I'm just trying to provide some basic level of argument. Obviously, I could get more specific if someone asked me this, right? If I was really creating this argument, I would tell you why it's misguided. But because we're just doing an example here, all you have to do is come up with a premise that in theory would support the conclusion or prove the conclusion. That's all this task is being asked, right? Don't think too hard about it. You're just getting rid of the crappy premises that made the fallacy, and you're replacing them with legitimate premises that make an argument. So again, if I, if I refer to the content of the idea as meaningless and stupid, uh, of, as misguided and stupid, then I can conclude that it won't work if it were true that the idea is misguided and stupid. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to wrap up that video there.